Well, my name's Professor Nick Pigeon um, from Cardiff University. Um, I'm an environmental psychologist and director of the Understanding Risk Research Group here. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be asked to give a talk to the um, workshop today. Um, and I hope it'll be inter of interest to many of you there, um, both uh, watching and listening. Um, I've been asked to talk about a major piece of research that uh, myself and colleagues conducted um, over the last three years called Transforming the UK Energy System, Public Values, Attitudes and Acceptability. And this research was sponsored primarily by the UK Energy Research Centre um, and also the Leverhulme Trust, who are a charity. Um, uh, the, the research um, to give a background to this comes from a, a, number of, um, uh, a number of considerations, but if we think about it, uh, certainly in the UK and in Europe and in other parts of the globe, uh, we're going to have to change our energy systems over the coming uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, not just because energy systems, as in some cases uh, here, the infrastructure has become old and needs replacing, but we're going to have to do things in a different way. Um, and certainly in, in, in Britain, um, the, the policy reasons for that are, are really threefold. Um, firstly, we have climate change and through the Climate Change Act of 2008, a commitment to reducing our carbon emissions in the UK to 80% um, of previous levels. So that um, implies a real change in terms of how we supply energy um, and how we use it. Then there's also the question of energy security. So we want to build systems which will keep the, the country going in terms of its energy um, services. So we can't forget that. And then finally, there's an affordability um, uh, element to energy system change. So you can provide energy, um, but uh, obviously it has to be at a price that um, all sectors of society um, can actually afford. And that's um, a real dilemma for policymakers. It's sometimes called the policy trilemma. Um, around energy system change because meeting one of those might mean it's might might actually mean it's quite difficult to meet one of the others so you're trying to optimize all three um, on the slide there you'll see there's actually a, a, a fourth driver which is often less discussed in the literature but uh, the sort of the non climate change environmental externalities so if you were to um, for example, cover an, an area, a landscape with large numbers of wind turbines, that would have some implication for the local environment, both the people's perceptions of the landscape as well as potentially other aspects of the landscape. So there are other environmental issues that we have to take into account. So these, these, these are complicated problems in terms of system change. Um, so the project was to look at um, the types of system change that might happen in the future. It's something we call in the project whole energy system transformation, by which we mean that in order to meet these policy goals, we will have to change things on the supply side, so production of more renewable energy in particular, um, and new technologies to do that as well as uh, demand side changes. So the way we travel, uh, the way we heat and uh, uh, provide energy in our homes, and how we actually view the existing building stock. Um, in the, in, uh, certainly in Great Britain in particular, there's, we have an issue about very old but historic housing stock, uh, which is very leaky in terms of energy. And so there's a big debate about how one can actually bring that up to standard um, in terms of not, not losing uh, energy and being much more efficient. So, uh, and if you're efficient at the dem uh, demand side, it means you don't have to supply so much energy through um, uh, uh, supply technologies. So the whole system transformation means thinking about the whole thing, how the whole thing might change in the future. Um, why as psychologists and social scientists uh, and I should say this is an interdisciplinary project, so we've had uh, uh, environmental sociology and geographers involved in the project as well. Um, why are we um, interested in this question? And it's because if you look at many of the scenarios of change, then you see people are implicated at, at all points, um, either as producers and consumers, as pro opponents and protesters. So uh, in some countries, for example, nuclear power stations, particularly since the accident, the major accident in Japan a couple of years ago, um, nuclear power um, it is uh, opposed by particular populations in some countries. Um, and we might vote uh, as citizens for particular political parties which would um, uh, promise or have particular policies around energy. Um, uh, on the demand side, it's interesting as well um, that uh, w we know quite a bit about 
um, how people respond to particular changes in the energy system, so um, electrification of transport, um, use of smart metering in the home, and other technical changes. And all of these will require consumer and uh, citizen buy-in um, if the actual changes are to be realised in a way that, that, again, saves carbon and meets the um, policy goals. So people are involved in all of this. Um, there are quite a lot of scenarios that have been posited. Um, again, our project is focused uh, at the UK level, but one could think at, at, at any level in any particular country like Slovenia or other countries of, of Europe, um, what, what is the current situation and how might it therefore change in the future. Um, and there's some scenarios which we looked at very early on in the project range from moving to a 100% renewable economy to a much more mixed economy that might have some nuclear power some continued use of fossil fuels with carbon capture, capture and storage, so to sort of business as, as, as usual. Um, so there are plenty of visions out there, but nobody knows entirely how, um, uh, which vision um, the, the country should take. Um, the project, I should say, um, comes out of a realization as well, um, because you could ask your question, you, yourself the question, why worry about scenarios as a whole? But in fact, we know quite a lot about public views and perceptions of individual technologies and individual changes on the demand side. So for example, we know a lot about public views on nuclear energy, um, on renewable energy such as wind. Uh, there's quite a lot of work being done on transport behavior and on the barriers to, for example, changing insulation, uh, putting insulation into your homes. Um, but nobody's really studied um, how people would respond if you explain to them both the policy drivers that I've explained earlier in the talk uh, and, and also the various scenarios for change that are out there. So what types of scenarios would people find, and parts of scenarios, would people find more or less acceptable? Um, so to explain uh, the project's uh, methodology, um, it was a three-year project, um, had three main stages in what we call Work Package 1, or the first phase. Um, we just looked at the scenarios for the UK that were there. We did interviews with experts um, across Great Britain to discuss what the most plausible pathways were for um, meeting the um, carbon targets out to 2050 in the UK and how the energy system had to change to do that. Um, then in Work Package 2 was the first um, uh, was the first work with members of the ordinary public. We did a qualitative phase of research where people deliberated um, some of these scenarios and trade-offs. They were full-day workshops. Um, in the three capital cities of Edinburgh, London and Cardiff, and then three more rural locations, and those were conducted in October 2011. Um, that data was then uh, analysed in some great detail. We um, both filmed and recorded all of the things that were said in these uh, one-day workshops, uh, and then subject them to social science thematic analysis. And that led on to, in Work Package 3, a major quantitative online survey of uh, over 2,000 people in Great Britain, uh, representative of the population, to follow up some of the uh, uh, some of the findings that had been initially identified in the qualitative research. So, um, uh, it, it, in all I say, uh, in terms of the results, um, I'm trying to give a flavour of the outcome of a very complicated um, set of data. Um, and just to overview the methods again, um, the, the main out puts of the project come from, as I say, the deliberative workshops and the national online survey, and you can see there. And, and really both of these were designed to get a cross-section of society, so we've um, really taken a, a, as many different types um, of, and, and location of people as we could um, uh, given the constraints of the project. And so we think that the results are, are pretty well re representative of the British population. So the other innovative thing that we did in the research was to use something called the My2050 tool. Um, if you go on the Department of Energy and Climate Change or DEC website um, in the UK and put in My2050, you'll get it. It's a tool that allows you to engage with the energy system, just showing one of the screenshots. I mean, it, it, by changing uh, uh, seven sliders on the supply side and seven on the demand side, and here we, in the screen we see the supply side, um, you can construct a future for the UK by adding more nuclear power if you want that, or adding more wind turbines on land, etc. And um, in both the deliberative workshops and the survey, we use this tool uh, not so much to elicit people's 
scenarios of the future, but to get people to think about the whole system uh, and, and all the different elements of the system that went into energy system change. And that was a particularly successful part of this project. Um, there are there's several reports available on the research, which I'd um, uh, just uh, point people to. Go, if you go to the reports section at the Understanding Risk uh, website, of which the, um, uh, the, the web address is there. Um, the first thing to look at, really, is um, we have something called the Synthesis Report, which puts together um, the findings of uh, the two work packages with the members of the general public and tries to draw and does draw general conclusions from those. Um, and, th and that was uh, co-authored by my colleagues um, uh, Karen Parkhill, Christina Dembski, um, Chris uh, Catherine Butler and Alexa Spence. Um, so that is the first place to start. And what were the key findings from the report? Well, um, it's often said the public really don't want change. That's sort of a stereotype you get in the media, but it was clear that when we outlined the policy drivers to people, the, the, the British public really wants and expects change. Um, with regard to how energy is supplied, used, and governed. And indeed, once we'd outlined the policy drivers in the, um, in the deliberative workshops, people said, well, why on earth isn't change happening? Surely this is an urgent problem, given these issues. Um, surely the government should be getting on with it. They didn't prioritize demand over supply, um, which is interesting. They said, well, you've got to work on all parts of the system in order to change um, uh, for the better in the future. Um, and above all, I think the key um, the key finding was that um, people wanted a system that moved towards a renewable supply, um, that reduced fossil fuel use um, in the context of people were very uncomfortable about um, the, the use of finite resources, the use of resources that would ultimately um, uh, run out uh, in society um, or I in the natural environment. So that was why there were, one of the reasons why there was concern about fossil fuel use. There were also other reasons. Um, and people were very concerned about waste on the, um, on the demand side. So um, any, the, the lots of examples of wa waste, wasteful use of energy were brought up, um, and that was one thing that people wanted um, as a change. Um, we looked at a number of other more controversial technologies, such as nuclear power, um, fossil fuel use, uh, that's generating electricity through coal and gas with something called carbon capture and storage where you capture the um, harmful carbon dioxide emissions and store them underground somewhere. And also on the demand side, electrification in home and transport. And there was more conditional support for these. Um, uh, the key thing, I think, that, again, that came out of the research is the importance of taking a long-term view. So people wanted governments and organizations, uh, corporations, and society as a whole to take a long-term view on energy system change and to respect their underlying what we've called values for change. And it's the values for change, really, that were the key theoretical outcome of the project. Um, this uh, slide shows, uh, and on the synthesis report, I think it's page 24, there's a table which unpacks this a little more. So if you can wish to go to that, that's where, where, where you can find this um, uh, set of concepts. But um, you can think about preferences for the individual elements of the energy system um, and, and any one preference, like somebody would like nuclear power or not like nuclear power, um, like carbon capture and storage, can, can be to some extent explained by a set of more underlying principles or values that, that people hold about energy system change. And the two most important ones were the ones at the top there, um, reducing the use of finite resources I've mentioned already, and reducing the overall levels of energy use. Um, and then sitting below this were a number of um, values which were important. And if you met some of the lower values on the uh, slide there, you were automatically able to meet the top two objectives of finite resources and reducing overall levels of use. So people wanted to avoid waste, they wanted systems that were efficient, but also that captured opportunities. So, so people were concerned that, that the future energy system would be as technologically um, and as socially as advanced uh, as it could be. Um, linked to that, people were very concerned that the energy system should not um, affect the environment, so environmental protection was very important, and um, the uh, respect for nature and naturalness was important. So systems which did not do that would be seen as less favoured. Um, people were also very concerned about availability and affordability of energy and, and, and uh, issues such as reliability and safety. But interestingly, the affordability question was not just about least cost, 
people were concerned, for example, about whether um, the price of energy would fluctuate um, rapidly in the future, um, which might make for some groups uh, the energy system or uh, energy services unaffordable at particular points of time, for in the winter, for example. So affordability was a more complicated thing than just having a system which cost less. Um, social justice was important, um, fairness, honesty and transparency, which were also linked uh, to the affordability question. Um, and also interestingly, this came out uh, in our discussion of um, new technologies in the home which might help or, or actually intervene to reduce your energy use. Um, autonomy and freedom, choice and control were very important as well. So systems which um, under some circumstances for example, maybe um, uh, something that switched off your showering water after two minutes would be seen as, a, 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 as, as actually um, breaching one's uh, freedom of choice in the home. So some systems, although in engineering terms, uh, uh, might be logical and good ways of avoiding um, uh, overuse of energy were, were less acceptable to people. And then, as I said before, long-term trajectories interconnected and systems that Im were improved and had quality. Um, so the overall conclusion from the research was that the acceptability of any particular aspect of energy system change or transformation will in part be conditional upon how well that change fits in with the value system that we've identified with the importance of these long-term trajectories. So just to give you one example that we um, uh, cite here, we, we know that solar energy uh, in, in many countries and to many populations is, is a very um, positively viewed technology and way of uh, generating electricity. And it's because it's renewable, it's, it's seen as renewable, clean, fair, and generally just um, in the sense that the people who uh, seem to produce the um, electricity also um, uh, uh, gain, gain benefit from it. Um, uh, but of course, one could think of solar schemes that would not um, garner su such um, strong public support. Um, for example, if one placed a solar scheme, a major solar scheme, in the desert which, or in, in an area of the world um, where populations were already marginalised and this had a detrimental effect upon local communities or on the local environment and maybe polluted the local environment in some way, then um, solar energy would be less acceptable to people. So it's, it's, it's not about the technology per se that generates the preference. It's, it's about the way the technology fits in with the values and, and the context in which the technology is used. So it's, it's, this is an um, important set of a kind of heuristic principles for decision makers when thinking about energy system change. Okay. Um, in terms of policy drivers for change, and I know in Slovenia um, it, uh, we've had a difficult time over um, electricity over the last couple of weeks. Um, we did ask about both climate change, energy security and affordability, and it was interesting that energy security, of which um, uh, continuous um, uh, supply of electricity and energy was important, was actually currently more important to people than climate change, although not overwhelmingly so. Um, another. I guess final thing I'd mention about this, which may well be um, to some extent uh, specific to the particular national context of the UK currently. Um, firstly, uh, people wanted change and saw national governments as responsible for bringing change because many of these big system things, uh, people would argue, are, are too complicated and involve too much money and too much major change for them as individuals in any way to influence at all. So governments were seen as taking a lead, but cutting across this was the question of trust um, both in the energy companies, so um, there's a quote there, um, uh, and uh, people felt that uh, could they trust the energy companies to, to make those changes, so therefore that was why government should be involved. Um, and I think it's um, also thinking about the, the politics of this, people are, are not entirely sure governments are going to take the right decisions, um, given in, in the UK certainly every five years um, we had elect a new government and maybe policy could change overnight. So there's a, a, a people questioned whether the changes could be um, feasibly made um, if they had to be really major changes um, uh, and how the electoral cycle would, would fit in with those changes. So there were lots of com comments and discussion about uh, trust in major players, which um, is a major finding of the research um, and, and is a major barrier to change, I think, in many countries, not just the UK. And it's one that the, the policymakers and politicians are going to have to address squarely um, before change can happen. 
So um, that's, in a sense, is all I want to say about what has been quite a long journey and a very complicated project. I'd like to acknowledge, obviously, my co-authors on the uh, paper and the synthesis report, plus um, my colleagues in both engineering and the architecture department uh, here at uh, Cardiff University, as well as the UK Energy Research Centre um, staff and directors who've been fully supportive of the project as it's gone along. Um, uh, if you require further information about the project, um, you can get that from the Understanding Risk uh, website um, here at Cardiff University or the UK Energy Research Centre website um, uh, in London. Thank you very much.